have your Bibles turn to Hebrews chapter 10. And last week, I talked about, well, I'll say this year, I've talked about that we're the righteous of God, I talked about that we're children of God, that we're sons of God, we're born of God. So we've dealt with identity. Last week, we talked about the just shall live by faith. We talked about dealing with fear. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind, right? Amen. Hallelujah. We need to put fear in its place. Fear, fear wants to control us. Fear wants to keep us back. Fear wants to keep us from going forward. Fear will cause us to run to substances instead of running to God. Fear will cause us to, to do things we normally wouldn't do, say things we normally wouldn't say. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power. Say of power. power. Say of love. love. And a sound mind. So in the midst of this, this fear that the enemy might be coming against us with, we've been given everything we need to be victorious. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us something else. He's given us power. He's given us love. And he's given us a sound mind. So we that are the righteous of God in Christ Jesus have everything we need in this world to become victorious. Can I get an amen? amen. You know, uh, 1 John 5, 4, which is the motto of our church, in the message, it says this. Uh, it says, every God-begotten person, that's a righteous person, conquers the world's ways. The conquering power that brings the world to its knees is our faith. Man, the person that wins out over the world is the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen, your faith is a conquering force. Your faith is a conquering power. And so you could say, last week and this week, I'm dealing with just going back to some basics. Basics of faith. You know, we need to go back to the basics. Amen? Amen. The basics of faith. Because the faith that he's given us is the means in which we overcome. I don't know about you, but there's things that I face that Justin needs to overcome. Are there some things you face that you need to overcome? Yes. Are you trying to over, are you in the process of overcoming? Yes. Three of you. Yes. See, you you're either have overcome something, you're either overcoming something, or there will be a day that you're going to have to overcome something. Yes. So we're going to need to know the basics of faith that's going to cause us to win in life. Yes. Amen? Yes. So look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. For the sake of time, let's look at verse 35. It says, therefore, do not cast away your confidence. Now, if we talk about confidence, we could, we could say confidence would be faith, right? You could say courage. So therefore, do not cast away your confidence. Now, the, this year is a year of progressing, right? Advancing, right? And we were given some, some warnings with that prophetic word, and that word was that we had to, what, stay in faith, right? It also said we had to remain focused. Also told us not to be distracted by the enemy, right? So it wants us to stay in faith. It wants us to remain focused. So this scripture here says, therefore do not cast away your confidence. So so if I could, if it's telling me not to cast away my confidence, that means I can. If it's telling me don't cast away your confidence, that means I could be tempted to, right? The warning to stay in faith, meaning that I'm going to have possibly have the opportunity to not stay in faith. I'm going to be tempted to not remain focused, correct? I'm going to be tempted to be distracted by the things that are going on around me. But say, not me. not me. See, this word tells us, it says, therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. Woo! Yeah. Amen. You like great rewards? Yeah. The King James, I believe it says it like this. It, it, has, it, has, a, it has a great recompense. Have you been recompensed? Yeah. It's not a word I use every day. How about you? 
a great, a great recompense of reward. I, I like Dr. Savell's translation of this. It means payday. We all like payday, don't we? So if I hold on to my confidence, if I hold on to my faith, that is I'm holding on to it, there is a payday at the end of me holding on to my faith. Look at your neighbor and say, don't let go of your faith. Hallelujah. Woo. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. Then it says this, verse 36, for you have need of endurance. I like, you know, endurance is, is, I like that endurance. But I think the King James probably benefits us a little more, and it's the word, it's the P word. <laughs> patience. It says you have need of patience. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't say you might need patience. It says, no, you need patience. Don't let go of your confidence because there's a great recompense award. You need patience. <laughs> when I'm driving, oftentimes my wife may not say it, but I know she's thinking, Justin needs patience. <laughs> I wish I could say that patience was under the curse. <laughs> you know, there was an old saying that patience is a virtue. I'm like, no, it's not. There's nothing virtuous about patience. No one likes waiting in lines. No one likes being in the doctor's office and they call us patience. You need to, your appointment's at 9.30 and all of a sudden you get called back at 10.45. And I wish you could say it's the Lord testing you, but... So patience is really when it comes down to a life of faith, as I look at the scripture, is not an option. Patience is not a personality. Oh, well, you know, that person, they're just, they're just, you know, they just have a patient personality. Well, I could say, no, I've been guilty of passivity, but that doesn't mean I have patience. Man, I just, just, everyone's just thinking, right, about this patience and how patient we are. How about you? I need patience. You need patience for your children? <laughs> you need patience? <laughs> you need patience for your boss? Do you need patience? You need patience for the assignment on your life. You need patience to see the promises fulfilled in your life. Say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. <laughs> I need patience. I need patience. <laughs> so here, therefore, don't cast away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of patience, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Now, we like the aspect of receiving a promise, but do we like the aspect of standing with patience? Patience, patience. You'll see patience a lot in scripture and sometimes we'll pick out certain words over others and there are some scriptures I could, we could talk about and I, I often thought of this and, and I would look at Thessalonians. I think it's Second, second Thessalonians chapter one, three through five and Paul exhorts the church of Thessalonica and he tells them, he goes, I've seen your exceeding great faith. And how your love is abounding. But then he says this. He says, you know what? And I'm bragging on you. And I'm talking to you, uh, to all the churches, about your patience and your faith. In, I wish he didn't say this, in your tribulation. He said, he goes, he goes, I'm talking about how amazing your faith is and how your love is abounding, but most important, I'm telling them about your patience and your faith as you're walking through adversity. 
Because I'm walking through adversity, there must be something on the other side of the adversity. Adversity is to keep you from an expected end. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Let's take a time. Let's look at verse 11. It says, And we desire that each one of you we desire each one of you to show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. The full assurance of hope, meaning you're holding on to this expectation until the end. That you do not become sluggish. You don't become sluggish. You don't become sluggish. You see... How many people here are, are, you're going somewhere in life? How many people here, you're, you're standing upon the promises of God? How many people, you have an assignment that God wants to do great things through your life? Let me see some hands. So what's going to happen is that is, a, that is a hope and that is an expectation down on the inside of us. But the warning here is don't be sluggish. That means I'm going to have the potential to let go of some things. You see, when things don't happen in our time frame or when we want them to happen, what happens, disappointment sets in, delay set in, and then we wonder why things aren't happening, and next thing we know, we become idle instead of going forward. But he tells them this, this full assurance of hope until the end, and he tells them, don't be sluggish. Meaning, meaning you know what, it may not happen in the time frame that you want it to happen. But he gives them a warning here, he goes, but imitate Imitate, you could say copy. It could be follow as examples those who through what? And what? Through faith and patience. Through faith and patience, they inherited the promise. So it wasn't about faith alone bringing the victory, but it was faith and what? It was this power of patience at work along with my faith that is gonna cause me to inherit a promise. If you wanna fulfill the assignment on your life, it's gonna require faith and it's gonna require patience. And I'm telling you, the enemy is going to want to magnify what's not happening. The enemy's gonna magnify the symptoms in your body. The enemy's gonna magnify what this person said, what that person did. But I'm telling you, we need to hold on to faith and patience. If you keep reading in context here, it says for, verse 13, for when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself saying, surely blessing I will bless thee, multiplying I will multiply. And so after he had what? Patiently endured, he obtained the promise. A 20 some year promise 20-some years of standing upon God's word, but it was in the midst of faith and patience that caused the promise to be a reality. And I, wanna, I want you to know, and I want the enemy to know that's waging war against your soul right now, that through, the faith, through faith and the patience on the inside of you, you will fulfill the assignment on your life. You will overcome every enemy. You will overcome every sat setback. You will overcome every demonic force and power that's been waged against you because you are settled in and you have this force, the force of faith and patience on the inside of you. Go to Psalms 40. Psalms 40. As you're turning there, I, I want to... I, I want to bring another scripture in the New Testament. You can make note of it if you're taking notes. It's Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And it tells this, this. It says that the things that were written aforetime, the things that were written beforehand, were written for our patience and our comfort. 
So, so think about it. He says the things that were written beforehand, the stories that we see in the Old Testament, they were written for you and I. What did Hebrews say? Be followers of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Romans again says, says the things that were written beforehand were written for our learning, for our learning, so we could learn something, we could add something to our lives, written for our learning that we might have patience and comfort in the scriptures. And then, and then it goes on and says, and the God, and he's the God of patience and comfort. He's the God of patience and comfort. You know, we can talk about the love of God. We can talk about the peace of God. We can talk about the joy of the Lord. We can talk about all those things, but Romans tells us that he's a God Amen. of patience. Amen. Don't you think that God wanted to do things a lot quicker than he was able to do them? But he had to do things the right way. He had to do things the correct way. And we, we talked about some of those things. He just couldn't just scrap it all and start over from the beginning. No, he had to put things in order. He had to put things in order. He had to do things the right way. He's a God of patience and comfort. So not only do he give, gives us the patience when we're going through things, but he gives us the comfort while we're going through them. Amen. Psalms 40. Verse one, just follow along with me here. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord. I waited patiently. See, a lot of us, we, we might wait, but do we do it patiently? <laughs> I waited patiently for the Lord and he climbed to me and he heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Mm. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. Wow. So I want to ask a question. Where is this person? They're in a pit. So the person that's writing this is writing it from a position where, they're at, where are they at? They're in a pit. It tells us it's a horrible pit. It doesn't even say it's a nice pit. It says it's a horrible pit. The way this translates in the, the, way this translates in the Hebrew, it's a pit of noise and a pit of confusion. It's a pit of destruction. If you look up the word horrible pit, that's what, that's what the word horrible means. It means noise, it means destruction, and it means confusion. But I have to understand that this pit is also has to become a place of decision. How do we live when we're in a pit? How do we live when we're in a place that's a place of destruction? In the midst of this noise, in the midst of this difficulty, we have to make a decision. So how do we live and persevere in this horrible pit? How do we make it beyond the horrible pit? What did he say? I waited patiently. Number one, negative situation, number one in this negative situation, this negative situation, first of all, it should drive us to prayer. I wrote some things down here. The pit is not a place to complain or cast blame. How often when we are in a pit, so to speak, we would prefer to cast blame and complain. Notice the psalmist here didn't cast blame, nor did he complain about the pit. It's not a place to expect defeat, quit, or just exist. The writer here, writing Psalms, it didn't just say, hey, I'm in this horrible pit, so let's just stay here and just see what happens. It's not, it's, it, it, the first thing to see in this negative situation, it should drive us to prayer. 
Number two, patience is what we need to maintain while we're on the way out of a pit. You see, when you're in the middle of the pit, the last thing you want to say, I waited patiently on the Lord. But what did he do? He heard my cry. So what was happening to the person in the pit? It wasn't someone complaining about the pit. He was crying to the one that could get him out of the pit. When you're going through trouble, it's not the time to run from God or just exist in your pit or stay and complain about your pit. The issue is, is are you crying out to God in the midst of your pit? Because the issue was, I waited patiently. I waited patiently on the Lord and what he inclined to me and he heard my cry. You need to know that God hears you right where you are right now. God hears you while you're crying on your bed at night. night. God hears you right now when you don't know what the next step is or what you're about to do. The thing is, is don't talk about how lonely it is in your pit. Start crying out to him. And I'm telling you, he's gonna deliver you out of your pit. I waited patiently on the Lord. The word, the word definition of patience from a worldly perspective is to put up with. It wasn't about him putting up with the pit. It was about releasing his expectancy on the one that gets him out of the pit. Biblical perspective of patience in the Hebrew, patience is the ability to remain constant. It's fixed or immovable regardless of how surrounding circumstances look or feel. feel. Patience, this is, patience stands no matter what. So patience is being, I waited patiently. That means the person, he's, he's like almost standing at the bottom of the pit looking up. He's about to come at that open of that pit any day, right? I cried to him and I know he heard my cry. Hey, I'm down here, you know what? But I'm not concerned about the pit. I'm looking at the answer. I'm looking at the answer. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah, you want me to sit down in this pit, but I'm not sitting down in this pit. I'm telling you, don't, you don't need to get someone to have a pity party with you in your pit. You need to, because see, patience is, hey, I'm standing out on the edge of my seat because I prayed, I cried to him, he heard my cry, and he's going to deliver me out of this, and he's going to set my feet upon a rock, and when I did, and I'm not going to be moved. You know, and I love how it says, and many shall fear, fear, many shall hear and fear and will trust in the Lord. You know how many people will come out of bondage when they see you, you getting out of your pit? Because that's what that says. It says, many. He put a new song in my heart, praise to my God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. I'm telling you when, you, when you get out of your pit and you did it God's way, I'm telling you, people are going to, it's going to say, hey, that only had to be God. That only had to be God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you getting beyond, just what, what, what Kevin and Penny shared, just his testimony, that, what is that? that encourages someone that's listening today. Hey, I've been in this pit. I've been down here. This happened to me. That happened to me. These are things that I did. But hey, I'm out of that pit. I'm no longer, I'm no longer in the pit. I'm coming out of the pit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We celebrate our failures too much. Hallelujah. Thank you. Say, I'm coming out. (laughs) Hallelujah. Faith and patience inherits the promise. Mm. Mm. I I saw this this morning. I told him, I've read this chapter, I don't know how many times, but connecting and just this little rabbit trail here. I, I, we could say, well, who, who's, who's the one in the pit? And we can look at, some, is it David in a pit? And, and most scholars believe that this is when David was in exile. But you have to understand, you have scripture that is, like I'm preaching to you right now. 
there's things that are going to hit you as an individual. But also at the same time, things are going to hit us as a church. Because when God speaks, his word is inexhaustible. His word can hit you past, present, and future at the same time. His word is alive. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides between soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So when the word is going forth, it's always going to challenge you in your soul. It's going to challenge you where you are, where you've been, where you are, and where you're going. That's the power of God's word. But he's also speaking prophetically here. And, you know, I started in, 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 in Hebrews 10 where it, said, where it said, don't cast away your confidence has a great recompense of reward. If you keep reading the rest of, of, of Psalms chapter, chapter 40, it talks about God doesn't desire sacrifices, but he desired a body prepared for me. In the volume of the book, it's written for me. So ultimately, what's coming to pass in Psalms 40 is Jesus in a pit getting out of a pit. In Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 10, quotes Psalms 40. So who's in the pit? If we look at it prophetically, because it tells us in the volume of the book, it's written for me, talking of Jesus, in which I read after worship. It's talking of Jesus. And Jesus saying, I waited patiently on the Lord, and he heard my cry, and he delivered me out of this horrible pit, and he set my feet upon a rock. He established my goings. Many, he put a new song in my mouth. What song was Jesus singing in hell? Hallelujah. Think about that. Jesus had to stand with faith and the force of patience to inherit the promise. The things were written aforetime for our learning that we might have patience and comfort in the scriptures. Jesus fulfilled his assignment with faith, faith and patience, how much you and I. If we look at the Greek word of patience, Greek gives us a lot more adjectives. It's sim a similar word about being unmovable, standing, but in the Greek, there's adjectives associated with this, and it's cheerful, hopeful, and expectant. So in the Greek, it's not just, oh, I'm putting up with a storm. I'm just putting up, I'm putting up with it. I'm putting up with it. No, it's cheerful. It's expectant. Last time I was in traffic, going into Dallas, in a backup, there was not a whole lot of cheer. I did not have the chair of cheer. The cheer of chair, it was the Grinch. it's the Grinch, come on, it's whatever, chair of cheer, something like that, anyway, probably said it wrong, but anyway, there's no, there's no patience that we want to be cheerful about, it's because, why aren't we cheerful when we're waiting, is because we don't have the right perspective while we're waiting, you see, it's faith and patience, and it's expectant, I'm expectant that this is turning around any moment. And you know what I want to tell you is it could be 10 years from now, but I have to be determined that you know what I'm still expecting. It's going to happen any day. It's going to be happen any day. Well, so pastor, you've been waiting for 10 years. I don't care. It's about to happen. It's about to happen. Any, any moment it's about to happen. Well, pastor, I haven't received my healing yet, but hey, hey, it, it's happened. It's something's happening right now. Something's changing right now. It's happening right now. I, that's why it says don't be dismayed. Don't be, but it, it's through faith and patience we're gonna inherit the promise. Gonna receive the promise. Patience is not idle. Patience is not sit back and do nothing. Patience is about a fixed expectation. Patience is a fixed expectation. Trust. Let's go to James 1. James 1. Hallelujah. Let's 
If all you, <laughs> you're going through something and you just need to find that song they did this morning, Covenant Keeping God, just turn that, just turn that on and just sing. Let that be the new song <laughs> for right now. He's a covenant keeping God. He's a covenant keeping God. Hallelujah. He's a covenant keeping God. Hallelujah. James 1. Verse 1, James, Jesus' half-brother, some translation call him Jacob, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And who's he writing to? To the 12 tribes which have been scattered abroad. I think the Passion Translation to this says, says God's seeds that have been sown throughout the world. So the church gets scattered. James is the pastor of the biggest church in Jerusalem they get, they get uh, uh, persecuted. Stephen gets stoned. All these things are going on, and yet, so all the tribes get scattered throughout the world. What, what is God sowing? See, enemy was trying to defeat the church, but yet what God, with the enemy meant for evil, God turns around for good, and so all he's doing is sowing a seed into another city for harvest. And so you have to understand persecution is happening um, you know, it, it's not the popular thing to be a Christian these days. See, their form of tribulation wasn't, I didn't get the parking place. <laughs> I mean, the things we feel like we're tribulating about, I mean, really, I mean, <laughs> I mean when you put it in perspective, I, I mean, I know someone that was, a, that was in the Philippines, and this is back in the 70s, and he's in a village in the Philippines, and, and he's there preaching the gospel. These, these gangs come in, put him on the ground, hold a gun to his head, put the, put the gun and said, said, do you still believe in Jesus? And they said, yeah. They went to pull the tr trigger, and the gun didn't go off. That's a different type of tribulation we don't quite know about. But yeah, I understand, it's, it's all, like I said, it's written individually, it's written to the church, it's written to wherever we might be. The issue is, are we going to hold on to God's word anyway? I mean, it's amazing to me, the people that lose their joy over things that aren't eternal and let it set them back for 20 years. Is God God or not? Can he restore me or not? Well, you don't know what she did to me. I don't care. I mean, I'm sorry for what you're going through. The issue is, I'm trying to tell you, don't get stuck there. If I got stuck in past disappointments, I would not be in Texas today. This is some rabbit trails there. So, <laughs> verse 2, my brethren, he's talking to the church. He's not talking to unbelievers. My brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Nothing joyful about that. Count it all joy. Count it all joy. Count it all joy. Meaning, have a greater expectancy. Have, have, an expect, have a joy. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Just to, just to kind of catch us up here a little bit. He's writing to the church, and, and we see in a few verses later, it tells us that God doesn't tempt us with evil. So when you're talking about trials here, it's not talking about God testing us. It's talking about the circumstances you're in testing you. It's talking about the trials that you're facing, the disappointments you're going through, the things that have been said, the things that are being done, those are the trials. Those are the things coming against you. But he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Knowing, so I've got to have a knowing. There's got to be some knowledge. There's got to be some information. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. I heard religious people years ago and say, you know what? Just the test that you're going through is just to see how patient you are, Rochelle. God just, bless his holy name. God just wants to see, Arnold, just how patient you really are and see if you're bearing up under this trial. See, that's if you think patience is a weak emotion. But when you understand patience 
is a spiritual force. Patience is a fruit of the Holy Ghost. Patience is a supernatural empowerment from God that comes from heaven. So count it all joy when you fall on diverse temptations, knowing, knowing, knowing this, that your trial of your faith produces patience. A better way to translate this is, is that when I'm in the midst of a trial as a nail, hey, I'm yielding to the force of patience and it is working for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The testing of your faith puts patience to work. So when I'm in the trial, when I'm in the temptations, what I need to do is patience is working. But the next verse says, but let, but let patience have its what? Perfect work. Hmm. See, this, this word let is a, is a qualifier. It's, there's, meaning there's, a, there's, there's an assignment. There is, if you had a stranger that showed up at your door and they knocked on your door, you have a decision to make. You're the, either going to let them in or resist them from coming in. So this word let is all about permission. This word let is all about access. So let, see, we like to always put it off on God, but see, James here is, is putting it on us. Let, let, see, it's there. I want you to know right now, if you're going through a trial, I want you to know patience is right there and patience is, hey, put me to work, Justin. Put me to work. See, you have, we have to look at the things that God has given us, the power, love, and a sound mind. We need to look at it as just like a hammer that a, a guy, a, somebody building a house. It's a tool that God has given me to erect or build something. Let patience. See, I'm either going to permit patience or I'm going to prevent patience. And I wish I could say 100% of the time, I have permitted patience to work. But there's often times I've prevented it. We either can permit it or we can prevent it. Let patience have its perfect work. Oh, let that patience, that force, let that patience work on the inside of you. Let it have its perfect work. Perfect work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say this after me. I'm going to, I'm going to let, patience let patience have its perfect work. Its perfect work. You see, I either permit or I prevent based on my actions and my attitude. I will either permit it or prevent it based on how I see the word of God at the moment. I will either prevent it or permit it based on how I see God opposed to how I see my situation. But the result of patience is being perfect and entire, wanting nothing. But we could look at it in the reverse. I like doing that with scriptures. The reverse. The, re the result of preventing patience will cause me to be incomplete, empty, and lacking everything. If I permit patience to have its perfect work, I'm perfect, entire, wanting nothing. If I prevent it, then I'm going to be incomplete, empty, and lacking everything. Wow. Patience is what causes our faith to bear up, bear up under pressure. So patience working is, is, like, is like this thing, that, this strength that undergirds us. And it's lifting us up saying, hey, don't sit down yet. Hey, hey, Justin, don't let go of the word yet. It's that, it's that still small voice on the inside of you. Hey, God's promises are true. Don't, don't let go. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, right now, yeah, the enemy wants to tell you you don't see anything working, but that patience is working. It's working. Yeah, it's saying, hey, don't give in. Don't throw in the towel. Hey, hey. 
<laughs> just, keep, get, just keep holding on to the word. Just keep holding, because it's faith and patience inherit the promise. Faith and patience inherit the promise. Hallelujah. I'm going somewhere. I'm, I've got somewhere to go. I've got an assignment on my life. Hey, faith and patience. Let faith and patience work. So patience is a key. I've got four things on what patience does. Patience is the key. I'm sure there's more than that, but patience is the key to bring me to a place of being perfect, entire, and lacking nothing. Let's go to James chapter five. James chapter five. And say patience is working. Patience is working. Mm. Okay, then I'll sobre now, it's interesting that the book of James starts about counting it all joy because of temptations, because of trials. And thank you, Father. Let's look at verse 10 and 11 first. Actually, verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brethren. See, we don't complain or blame in our pit. Don't grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge of all the earth, you could say, is standing at the door. Verse 10, my brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endured. Wow. We count them blessed who endured. Next, keep reading. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. And the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So the book of James starts with talking about trials and temptations, right? He gets to the end and he talks about the prophets declared thing. What did they declare? They, but they declared it and they endured with patience. And then it, com then it compares it to Job. We always look at, at the, the difficulties that Job went through and all the setbacks that Job went through for over the, with some say, nine months of his life. But yet at the end of Job's life, that's what it says, look at the end of Job. It didn't say look at the beginning of Job. It said look at the intended end of Job. And it tells us this, what because it started saying, with patience, perfect, entire, wanting nothing. I would say at the end of Job's life, if we look at the intended thing, is to be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If we would even focus on the prophets of yesterday, they're even looking at today and we're saying, I'm so glad that I stood. I'm so glad that I stood on the word. I'm so glad that I declared the prophecies about Jesus coming because he came and we stood on that and we saw it come to pass. We are that great cloud of witnesses. Look verse seven. Remember, everything is for us present, but also in the future and to the church. Verse seven says, therefore be patient, brethren, until... The coming of the Lord. It doesn't say, hey, stop being patient. It tells us how long to be patient. Until the coming of the Lord. So, Pastor, when do I let go of my patience? Never. How long do I hold on to the promises? Forever. When can I let go? Never. Well, I'm tired of being patient. I know, but let patience have its perfect work. Until when? until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth? Hallelujah. Waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Hallelujah. See, I believe that's for us where we are right now, but I also believe it's for where we are as a church. The Lord is coming soon. And we need to let patience have its perfect work. You got time for a couple more scriptures? Go to Luke. Luke 8. Luke 8. The first one I said about the patience is a key to bringing me to a place of being perfect, entire, wanting nothing. Number two, dealing with James 5, is patience is a key to restoration of all things. Patience is a key to restoration of all things. Because Job was restored twice as much. Hmm. 
In Luke chapter 8, this is one of, we call them the, the granddaddy of the parables. Parable of the sower. We see it in Mark 4, Matthew 13. We see it in Luke chapter 8 here. And we know the sower sows the word. And we know he tells us that the, the word was sown on different types of soil. But we need to understand what is the soil. The soil is, is our hearts. And we often talk about the seed that was sown, and it was this one sown on, on, uh, on the ground, but it, was, it didn't have much. It wasn't really sown deep. It was just on the surface. They, they heard, just heard the word. They heard the word, and it was sown on that heart, and, and it said the enemy came immediately and stole that word. We can talk about the other, the other different soils. One talked about, you know, the cares and the deceitfulness of riches. We talk about the anxiety and the cares of this life. And, and each one of them, you know, whether it's the enemy stealing it, whether the weeds grow up and choke it, there's an element that very rarely do we ever talk about as it pertains to the heart that is receiving the seed of God's word. Thank you, Father. For the sake of time, let's look at verse 14. It says, Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit. Verse 15 says, But the ones that fell on good ground are those who having heard the word with a noble and a good heart, keep it and they bear fruit with what? Patience. It's not just hearing the word. Even hearing the word and understanding the word, there's something more to it. You see, I could be good ground and we could have good ground behind this property and I could go out and I could plant a garden. I could plant tomato seeds and, and be expecting tomato seeds, but yet, hey, I did everything that's required for this to be good ground. I have everything, the nutrients of the earth just right. I have everything that's needed. I've got water. It's in a place where it gets the proper amount of sunlight and I've planted good seed into good ground. But does that mean I'm gonna have a harvest? Well, what if all of a sudden I go back there and I wonder how come I'm not seeing any tomatoes yet? And I go back and I dig up that seed. It's like, oh, well, maybe that seed doesn't work there or maybe my heart needs to be planted in another church. So I go plant that somewhere else. Or... It could be a number of things. Maybe, you know, there, maybe there could be weeds there. Instead of picking weeds, we try to find another thing so we have no responsibilities to get rid of our own weeds and not our pastor get rid of our weeds. Maybe. And so we keep moving the seed around thinking the seed is the problem. But really, the seed is our patience. Because the farmer has to wait for the good seed and the fruit that comes from the earth. So I could have good seed, I could be hearing the word, I could be, be have it in the right soil, but yet still not produce any great harvest. Why? Because it's only going to come forth with what? So the key ingredient to see breakthrough in my life, yes, is the word of God and the faith that that word produces, but it's also patience. And when patience has its perfect work, I'll be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So far, there was three things. These are the three things. Patience is the key to bring me to a place of perfect, entire, lacking nothing. Number two, patience is a key to restoration of all things. Number three, patience is a key to fruitfulness and fulfillment. And the last one, go to Hebrews 12, and I'll close with this. Thank you, Father. Hebrews 12, verse 1. 
Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, lay, us, lay aside every weight and sin which so easily, easily ensnares us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured. He endured the cross, he despised the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So patience is a key to finishing my race. You, don't fulfill, you want to fulfill your assignment? Lay aside every, every way and sin and let us run with patience. How do we run with patience? We look to Jesus. We look to Jesus because he looked to patience. We look to Jesus. He endured the cross. He endured the cross. I sure can endure this. Be followers of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Stand to your feet. Thank you, Father.